Hi, yeah, I must admit when I was um, preparing the abstract for this, I was expecting to be very much a poet among archaeologists, <laughs> so I'm, I'm a bit surprised to be an archaeologist among poets. Uh, um, um, the landscape I'm talking about today is uh, Stratford, Florida, or in Wales, that's Astrad Fleer, um, which is a wonderful ruin um, in the middle of nowhere in Caribbean. Um, uh, and uh, it's a very special place, and everyone who goes there says it's a wonderful place, and, and poets who go there tend to write poems about it, um, which I'll, I'll talk about later. As a sort of a, from the archaeological point of view, if the archaeologists who are here want to know this, <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, it's a Cistercian Abbey built, lived in, used, um, and then left as a ruin. Um, it's a very simple traje trajectory. Um, there were Victorian excavations which basically dug out all the rubble and exposed the ruins pretty much as we see them today. Um, scheduled in the early round of uh, Welsh sites being scheduled, recognised as being nationally important. It's one of the Cali sites. And uh, since, uh, since 1999, it's been the subject of a long-term research project um, by the University of Wales, Trinity St David, um, and uh, I was peripherally involved in that project for a bit, um, which is where um, the work I'm talking about today arose from. Uh, in terms of the, what that research project is, it's got a very broad definition of what it's trying to achieve, and as David, David Austin is the, uh, the investigator on this, um, and he's taken a bit, as you might expect from Lampeter, taken a very phenomenological and landscape based approach to what they're trying to achieve. So I've folded out here the key things, what, they're, what, they're, what the, the intention is to produce, clear expressions of spaces, real people once moved, understand their complete experience with embedded and deeper meanings. So very explicitly not being another boring description of, of a history, uh, landscape history, that this is about, this is about people. Um, and so that's, that's very much where, where they're coming from. And in, in using the sort of uh, traditional approach of like to, to, to phenomenology, saying, okay, we'll look at different aspects, <coughs> sort of different aspects of the landscape, can we decide to find where the patterns are? If there's lots of things going on that people are doing, is there sort of that, that we are making the, the step to say, well, obviously that must be important. And then um, if we're feeling brave, then we might get as far as saying, well, obviously there must be some sort of meaning, and we might want to suggest what those meanings might be. And that's a perfectly reasonable sort of archaeological guessing game, if you like. So certainly it's a, a step, it's a process, uh, moving from like hard fact away into towards speculation, but doing so in a, in a sort of approved archaeological way. And as I was hinting at earlier when we were talking about the the, t the way you write archaeological reports, um, what I <coughs> What this project has yet to produce is a coherent phenomenological account of that landscape um, to sort of fulfil that promise that was there in the, in the original research design. Um, and I think, it's, I, mean, I think there is fundamentally a problem that conventional archaeological narratives are not a good, good fit for presenting phenomenologically informed descriptions of the significance of landscapes. Um, I think there's a, you know, there's a reason why we haven't seen many of those. It's because um, they're actually sort of crunching their gears. So, as an example, one of the areas, one of the key things they picked out on in terms of the landscape is that, well, you know, the way that water is used in the landscape is an interesting topic, and, and uh, there's all lots of different interesting things going on. Um, there's holy wells in the area, obviously, that connects to the sacred ge geography of the area. Um, there's this central feature in the abbey, which has recently been re consecrated as a, as a holy well. Um, uh, unusual to have a water feature in the crossing of an abbey. That's how unusual, apparently it's unique. Um, there's something weird going on here, or something specific going on. And then obviously it has a Cistercian, Cistercian abbey. They're very keen on their drains and water supplies and so on. You'd expect that. Um, and then it's the whole, the whole how you define clean and dirty across a landscape in terms of where the clean water comes in, where the dirty water goes out, how those get, how you make sure they're kept separate. Which is, all sort of anthropological stuff there. Um, and then you've got two rivers, this is at the junction of two rivers, um, and one of them, well, they seem to have, one is used for industry, one of them isn't. So, um, now is that a practical thing or is that to do with the safety landscape? And again, the area is surrounded by lakes and peat bogs, which they were aware of, I mean, obviously they weren't necessarily doing much there, but, the, but essentially uh, the whole question of water in the landscape is going to be one strand of whatever this narrative that's produced. Up and it will, will, will conclude. 
so that's so, so we're waiting for the for that to be produced. Um, in the meantime, um, what my, my involvement so with the project, I was there for uh, about two years, which involved me spending a lot of time on the site there, um, talking to um, the, the, the the team, but also to to visitors. Um, and one of the things that came out from that was re recognizing that, um, as I said at the start, this is a place that inspires a lot of poetry. And in fact, as well, I ended up putting together an anthology of all the poems that have been written about Strand, Florida. And as far as I know, it's the, the most poetic place in the world. <laughs> um, because to have this many poems written by, by um, if you're not familiar with some of these, some of these names, um, basically an, almost every, every poet in Wales goes there, and almost every person does write a poem about it. Um, that's, um, which is inter um, interesting as, as a cultural phenomenon. Um, but what surprised me when I was looking at it, uh, what I was expecting was that um, somebody would write a, a, write a, written a significant poem a long time ago, and then people would write, write basically writing a response to that. I mean, it, 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 it perhaps it was picking up on Erin's idea of these, of these echoes. But that, in fact, it was certainly the, the people I asked, they said, no, they hadn't, they hadn't bothered to <laughs> investigate this literary tradition. As far as they were concerned, they were responding directly to the landscape. And uh, there's, there's a spe section there in terms of how, what, what they're trying to do with these, these poems. Um, some of them are very much, um, so I've, I've called them reflective, being about the poet's experience of going there on a visit on a particular day and trying to describe that. Um, that's, you know, sort of, that's one type of poem. There's that type of poem where they basically try and provide a, a condensed poetic version of the guidebook and give you all the information about why it's an interesting site. Um, so that's a, a, sort of a spectrum in terms of what they're trying to achieve. So this is an example. Um, I'll just read, read the, the, uh, the, the, the last, the last verse of this. If you can't read it all. Um, so this was uh, T. Gwynne Jones, written in Welsh in, in the 1930s, and then uh, this uh, English version, which follows the same line scheme, um, uh, was put there uh, in the early 40s. But though oblivion and walk by death on ruined faith, I see, yet in the pale lustre fear, my fear and sorrow flee. So very much a romantic, an appropriate book, describing a romantic ruin and you know, sort of a meditation on the futility of human ambition in the context of nature and the sort of thing you know, people have been writing for 100 years or so. Um, there are bits which make it specific to this place. Um, so you've got mentioning about the 12 good abbots and there's the 12 abbots gravestones, they're not called that now, but the gravestones are still there. Um, David Abbruin, um, who uh, you not mentioned, and um, then the tradition that he was buried there. Um, so there is enough here to say it is site specific. He wouldn't have written this, written this poem about somewhere else. Um, but this is an, you know, an account of, I suppose, an, an experience of an encounter with the past and with nature um, on that particular day. Um, this is a more contemporary one, this is Gwyneth Lewis, and this was actually commissioned by Cadu as part of their uh, recent work on trying to promote, promote the site. Um, and this is, and, and I was talking about this, it's actually based on her childhood memories of multiple visits to this site. It was a place they came to a lot. Um, and in terms of archaeology, if you like, there's a tiny bit there, but there's a bit, a bit about the doorway. Uh, and she said that she'd actually written this poem about, about this, the, the doorway as a liminal space, and that she remembered this as being effectively like a time travel uh, exercise. So, there's, so the, the, the people do come down, they, 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 there's something about it they want to capture, something about sort of being in that space, um, which makes them think, about, you know, think sufficiently seriously to want to try and capture. Um, and I was just thinking about this, and, and I'm a poet and an archeologist, and uh, as an archeologist, what's interested me um, is the idea of trying to, trying to be very, very specific about particular moments in time, and trying to sort of try and see how far we can get towards have, uh, uh, providing a narrative of particular moments, uh, rather than the, the sort of the, the lingerie and sort of lots of things, boring things going on over a long distance, but trying to say, like, oh, how specific can we be? So essentially, I set myself the challenge of writing a poem that captured the experience of one of the monks in the Abbey in, it was about 1320, early spring. Um, so this is, this is uh, my, the poem I wrote about it. Um, and what I'm going to do is sort of, uh, basically what I was trying to do is trying to jam as much archaeological, uh, archaeologically informed information into, into a poem while leaving it still substantially poetic. Um, I won't read it out, I'm going to go through all the way 
Um, but yeah, so, that, so that, that's where it's coming from. And so because of, obviously in the course of the, the Landscape Archaeology Project, an awful lot of information has been gathered about what's going on in the environment around, around the cloisters. Um, to start off with, okay, we, we know that there's some vellum there because it still survives, and we know that you, they wrote on vellum, the vellum's still there, therefore so they, they had it. Um, in order to make their own vellum, as, as this assertion did, then they would need to be doing industrial activities, they'd need to have access to animals, the animals would need to have access to pasture. So although, you know, sort of it's basically, I, I think we've, we've got the vellum, that's implying the existence of this hinterland of other activities and other, other bits of land use. And then in terms of physical locations, uh, in fact the particular trigger for me writing this poem is I was talking to a visitor about the, um, the, the manuscripts that had come from this, this scriptorium. Um, and she said, oh, well, whereabouts would this be written then? I said, oh, over there. <laughs> uh, uh, and it is there, that's where the scriptorium would be, in the cloister, um, or south facing, so it gets the light. Um, so whoever it is, it's like an invented person, but we know exactly where they're sitting. Um, which is, uh, you know, sort of that sort of feeling of connection then, saying, oh, actually, that is, that is ought to be so specific. Um, so, yeah, so we know, obviously, we know a lot about uh, cloistral buildings, so we know a lot about about the you know where, where people would be, and then okay, so, so I, I imagine <coughs> the next two day, they're going to be cold. They're going to be just wearing a habit, um, but where do they get the habit from? Well, they make that wool to get wool into the sheep. And the sheep to get the to, to deal with the wool, you need the you need the mills um, uh, to get the ink. Again, you know they're using ink. We're getting where are they getting those from, and so on. They're basically implying the existence of this entire monastic landscape. Um, in, in this one particular moment. And one of the features of the valley is it, it's a very, very quiet place and the sound carries very well across, across, the, across the abbey. Um, and so uh, I've had the experience myself of being some distance away and hearing people chopping wood half a mile or a mile away, or something exaggerated, but a long way away. Um, and we know there's managed woodland and we know that they were, the discussions were busy actively doing it. So part of being a monk in that cloister would have been hearing all that sound coming from outside. Obviously, they would, in a way, they're sequestered from all that, but in a way, they're not. And I'd say one of, the, one of the starting points was well, what's weird is that about this one particular moment in time is that left a lasting legacy. The, the thing it created, the, the thing, the, the bit of the writing on vellum is still here. Um, and that there were odd moments where that, if that, that sort of legacy is produced, as opposed to all the other moments which will produce no, no specific legacy. Um, and this, uh, this manuscript is now in the, the Land of the Collection. Um, it's known as the Monk's Blood Bank Manuscript. <laughs> you can see it's stained here. Um, these, this was a manuscript that was written um, at, at uh, Strata, Florida. Um, again, it's a very, I mean, well, there's some, some debate whether it's actually Monk's Blood, but it's, like, it, it's been called that for a long time. But the point is that the creation of a manuscript um, is one of the things that was happening on that landscape. Um, it's, it's one of the few things that's actually come through almost clear right through to the present day. And so, in a way, what, what I was trying to do in that poem was the same as, um, as uh, they Ross has been trying to do with his map work. Um, and you can see the start here, um, uh, where I said, okay, well, we've got to have sheep farms, and what Things which I referred to in my poem about this particular spot here, sort of basically trying to put as much of that in. And in creating a recreation of entire landscape, I mean, we don't have a problem with artists doing that. We give the artist a brief and say, right, do it like it was in 1320, please. Fill in these details, we know roughly where they are. You can, there's some bits which are a bit grey. Um, you might want to make it smoky or a bit vague uh, if there's some details we're not sure of. But we're quite happy to say, well, that's, that, this is a, a piece of interpretation which we, we, can, um, we can present and, if necessary, dispute. Um, and you know, I, I would raise the question about why we're not equally willing to do the same uh, with a piece of uh, poetic narrative. So in terms of my observations as, as um, in the process of going through this, um, First of all, I'll say that, you know, that unlike the other poems I mentioned, 
you know, I, the, the poet is not them. The, the, the person who I'm trying to write about isn't me. You know, I'm not, I'm not a monk, I'm not medieval, I'm not a Christian. Um, but what I was trying to do was embody, as far as I could, um, that, that, uh, those characteristics in order to um, see from that viewpoint. And the tie, tie up again, we mentioned site specific performance, um, tied up with that. So basically, it's, it's written in dialogue with the space. It's open house, but how, how overt we have to be in our response to the landscape. In some cases, you, you, you can say, well, this could have been written about anywhere. You know, there's nothing specific you can point to which would actually um, tell you where, it's, where it is. Well, I say in other cases, you can just over, over it. Um, essentially, one of the freedoms of writing poetry rather than archaeological narrative is that you can, you feel empowered to um, take those guesses further forward and say, for an exercise in full imagination. I know a lot about Cistercian monastic archaeology, um, but I still have to guess. <laughs> and again, it's interesting you mentioned about things being iterative. Um, one of the, an early version of this poem had them had had the scribe cutting the, the, the quill to a point, and then someone pointed out to me, well, actually, no, they were using a broad edge in order to, 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 to write the uh, uh, a monastic script. So it's, so it's you know, iterative, subject to change. And essentially, so I, I would see sort of this type of poem as being a synecdoche, that it is a, a small piece of, as authentic as we can make it, narrative that stands in for the whole of the landscape, um, at, at, at which we could describe at, at length if, if we wanted to. And so I would say, I mean, I say make, make, making a point that's already been made, really, um, that po using poetry in this way is an opportunity to create sense, to create places, um, that we can, we can make things specific and real. And it's interesting, in sort of certainly in writing the poem, kept coming back to the question of, OK, what would it actually be like? Where would the sunlight come from? What would you smell? What would you hear? Um, it's much easier in a world. That's, that's a bit that's often missing from archaeological narratives. Um, it's easy to say what, people, what, what stones people were doing or what, whether people were digging a post hole. Um, those are very specific things. Um, but in a way, you know, so if we can try and look at those, those other elements, that might be more, more interesting. And, and in the end, you have to produce something which all you can say is it rings true. Um, obviously, it's not actually true, um, <coughs> but it sounds all right. Okay, um, and uh, there, have, there is a website, so if you're forced to look at a question, there is a website where you are, um, uh, where the results of the research projects are being presented, um, uh, or say, well, there's, no, there's nothing about what, 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 um, what I just talked about. Okay. Thank you very much.